All right, here we go. I couldn't remember all my percentages, and somehow I forgot the, the slide, so I, I had to look it up real quick. All right, number one, what percentage of American families have no savings account? A, B, C, or D? Answer is C, 25%. 25%. That, that's a little better than, of course, D. Okay, so this is important, just so you can get this. Now, this has probably been five or four or five years ago since we've done this, and it's probably changed a little bit. The average American household income, I'll just tell you, is B, $47,000. But three is the one I want you to catch for a second. Uh, the amount of debt in the American that the average American family carries is how much? D. D, yeah. Uh, and that should say, I don't know if yours has it corrected, it should say 117, is that what yours says? Yeah. Uh, that includes a mortgage, right? That includes a mortgage and stuff. And so the, the point simply is, is we don't have a lot of savings accounts uh, and we have a lot more debt than, than maybe we should at some times. So we'll, we'll talk, we're going to talk about that. Um, the importance of, uh, the importance of a father in the home. All right, I'll just give you some percentages. We'll, we'll, we're going to talk about fatherhood in a little while. 70% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 80% of youth sitting in prisons grew up in fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. Uh, number five, this is important for us to at least talk about because we're going to talk about it in a minute. Average marriage, married couple has sex how often? Eight to ten times per month. That's actually works out to about 2.5. And you're going, how do we do 5.5? That's interesting, right? Now, here's, here's why we... It was better for me than you, right? Can I say that? I'm being recorded. Sorry. <laughs> Man, you people on video, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? I was trying to know what we were actually talking about. <laughs> now, what we want you to understand is we don't know who these people are that got polled. Uh, each of you, I mean, seriously, we don't want, you know, we don't know if these are honeymooners or senior citizens. And so, basically, what we're trying to say is when it comes to average statistics on stuff like that, you make your own average. Okay, you may look at this and go, you know, hey, that's not enough, that's too much. Whatever it is for you should be what you and your spouse mutually decide together. That's kind of how that's supposed to work. It is a mutual decision between a husband and a wife of here's where we should be. And, and that's important that you say that because a lot of marriages feel like the person with the lower sex drive is the one that should get to pick how often, and that really shouldn't work that way. They should not be the gatekeeper to that. It ought to be a mutual decision between a husband and a wife, it's kind of like bargaining for a car. The person with a higher sex drive and lower sex drive, what did I say? That was funny. Okay. <laughs> that look is usually you said something wrong. <laughs> Let's keep going. We're, still, we're on TV, so we have to. It, it should be one of those situations to where you come together like you're buying a car and somebody goes, how about, how about four times a week? And another one goes, no, how about two times a week? And you meet in the middle for three times a week. And so that's, that's how you figure that out. It's a mutual decision between a husband and a wife. And that's something that we always try to talk about. Number six. 47% of teenagers have not had sex, and we, we think that's better than what it could be. 72% uh, of parents are talking to their kids about sex, and that makes us feel good too because that needs to happen. Uh, in fact, to just throw that out there, if you've got kids in elementary school, that's when you start, not, not when they're in, ju in junior high, they've already heard stuff, and they're probably already really confused and may have already heard it wrong. And so elementary is where it starts, and you start giving a little at a time to where they can understand. And then as you go, as they get older, it's easier to talk about because you've been talking to it, talking to them about it for years. So start young. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any suggestions on, um, I guess, material books, et cetera? Actually, yes. Like, you know, like Actually, yes. There's some really good stuff on Amazon, and I don't know off the top of my head, but if you'll, our email address is on here. If you'll email me, I'll find it for you. But there's some really good books on talking to both kids 
and teenagers uh, from, from young to older age-appropriate age material. There's some good, good stuff. And, and I, we just forgot to, to remember what that was. But that is good stuff, and that does need to start happening uh, early. That's, a, that's just a healthy thing. They need to know they can come talk to mom and dad about stuff from an early age that they are confused about or don't understand. Um, number eight's a little confusing worded-wise, but it gets you to understand a couple of things. 34% of teens have had sex during the last three months. Uh, and of the 34%, 41% of those did not use any kind of birth control or condom when they had sex. And, and the point there is just that there's still some education in a lot of areas, just, just some things that we need as families to work on. Uh, number nine, 40% uh, of families today are blended families. And I actually probably would think that'd be closer to 45% now are blended families. We have more and more blended families all the time. And then uh, about 46% are traditional, or now they're called nuclear families. Uh, meaning if you're not a blended family, you're a nuclear family. And that may be a new word that's kind of on the horizon to you. Not traditional anymore. To give you an idea, Lee grew up in a nuclear traditional family with a mother and father. I grew up in a blended family. A little bit different blended family we'll tell you about later on. Um, Number 12, this is a good one. I, I'm sorry, uh, number 11. The number one fear of children and teens today is something will happen to their family. That's their greatest fear, especially for elementary school kids because they go to school every day and their peers who sit next to them say things like, I haven't seen my dad in a year or my mom left this weekend and I don't know if she's coming back. And so they see this all the time. I have a, one of my closest friends in the world said he walked by his daughter's diary that was on the bed, said, I never read it, never read it, but here she is in third grade. And I thought, I'd look to see what she's praying about. And she was praying that her mom and dad would not divorce. And he said, where in the world would she get an idea that we would ever do that? I said, because she goes to school and sees it every day. That's why it's important as a mom and dad that you reaffirm to your kids that you love your spouse. That's why being affectionate is a healthy thing around your kids. Let them see you kissing under a mistletoe or in a kitchen and go, gross, get a room. That's healthy for them. They need to see things like that. They need to see you acting as a, as a husband and wife and not just as a mom and dad. Uh, number 12, the average married couple gets four minutes daily alone with one another. Isn't that crazy? Now, let me throw this out there. We posted this on Instagram the other day on our marriage page. Sitting in the room with your spouse while y'all are looking at your phones does not count as quality time, okay? Average, average married couple gets four minutes daily alone with one another. That's because of jobs, kids, television, internet, social media, hobbies, and everything else. You gotta have more than four minutes. Number 13, we just find this interesting because we have kids these ages. The average age that men got married in the 80s was 22, which is what I was. Uh, and women was 20. But today, the average age men get married at what? 29. And a woman is 27, so they're waiting longer. Is that good and bad? That's good and bad. There's good things and bad things. You're, you're probably getting a little bit more mature people that are getting married today. That's healthy. Are there some cons in there? Sure. You get people that are more set in their ways. So there's maybe some adjustments that have to be done in there. But it's kind of an interesting t statistic that stands out to us that uh, is kind of neat in there. Um, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about marriage. Uh, let's talk a little bit about marriage. And why that's important, not just to you, but also to your family and also to your kids. And let's look at some things that deal with this right here. Okay. So, we, we say the number one thing your marriage needs uh, is kind of the direction that we're going to go. But before we do, let's talk about differences for a second. Uh, how many of you in here feel like you married somebody that's different than you? 
and it's okay to raise your hand. You know, there was a time where people go, we got to be so in common and so similar. Well, I think there were some couples that were looking for somebody so much like them that it drove them nuts because uh, I married myself. Uh, and, and Lee and I are extremely different. Uh, even after 32 years of marriage, yes, I got that right. I can't remember, 32 or 3, it was in there. Uh, we are different. Now, just to give you a few ideas on that, I'm an on-time person, meaning if you're an on-time person, you understand that. If you're not an on-time person, on-time means you're 15 minutes there before it starts. That's on time, all right? Yeah, there you go. Uh, if you show up at 9 a.m. and it starts at 9 to on-time people, you're late. Uh, be there before it starts. Now, I didn't marry an on-time girl. <laughs> Let's just say, if running late were an exercise, I would be so bent. <laughs> we, we make uh, negotiations on leaving time stuff, you know, like, what time are we going to leave? Well, I think we need to leave at 6. I think we need to leave at 8, and we try to figure out a place to meet in the middle on whatever it is where we're going. So uh, that's the difference in between two of us. I'm, I'm a little bit on the unorganized side. Just a, just a little bit. I'm pretty organized. Uh, I think everything has its place, and I want everything in its place. I'm learning to do better than that. You're doing better. I'm doing better. Uh, I'm not a big details guy. I don't need a lot of details to function in this world. Uh, a lot of trips we take, Lee will go, where are we going, where are we staying, where are we doing this? And I'll be going, I don't know, I didn't ask any of them questions. You know, I will figure that out when the time comes. Uh, don't need a lot of details to function, but someone else does. Yes, I need details. I want to know who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's right. And sometimes she says, forward me those emails so that I will know. <laughs> I'm an extrovert, and this is fun to me. And I'm an introvert, and like Trey said earlier, I'm still trying to figure out how he's convinced me to be up here for you guys. Yeah. And I just killed the whole thing. There we go. Uh, Music-wise, we actually like a lot of the same music, uh, but I'm a, I'm a pretty classic rock guy, and she's a... Kind of like contemporary Christian or classic country. There you go. Uh, I'm a morning, pro I love mornings. Mornings are fun. I'm already excited about getting up in the morning. I would just tell you that. <laughs> I, I am. I just kind of, I don't even know why we sleep sometimes. Sleep just gets in the way. If we could avoid sleep, I would be so happy. And, and I love when the alarm goes off, which mine doesn't go off very often. I just get up, you know, and I'm happy when I get out of bed. And mornings are great. Let's just say that I'm, I'm not. No, I'm, I'm a night owl. In fact, it's usually mid-morning before I decide if I'm even going to be a Christian for the day. <laughs> usually about 10 a.m. after a couple of cups of coffee. Uh, I, maybe it's because I'm a morning person and I like early mornings and I get up every morning about 6. Uh, but I fall asleep very quickly. Um, I mean like superhero power quickly. Sometimes, you know, you, if you've ever had surgery, you remember those surgeons that used to go count down from 100 backwards and you'd get to like 99 and wake up, you know? I can do that at night. I can lean over and go, I'm going to go to sleep now and do. And so, I mean, I can go to sleep so quick. I love that. Yeah, it did take me long when we were newlyweds. We'd get in bed and I'd think, oh, we're going to talk now. And, and I'd be talking and, 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 and he'd start snoring. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't, I don't, I envy his superpower to fall asleep in 30 seconds because some nights I feel like I just lay there and wait until morning. I'm, I'm not a very good sleeper. And, and if we want to talk, it's uh, we, better leave that light on. Yes. Actually, I can go to sleep with the light on. <laughs> we don't talk at night. Uh, yes, I, I like coffee. Coffee's fun to drink in the mornings. And I drink coffee in the mornings for the protection of others. <laughs> um, I'm a neat freak. I'm a little sloppy. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I shop I, very methodically. I love to use coupons, read labels, compare prices. If it's clothes, I like to try everything on. Yeah. yeah, I can get a whole new wardrobe in about 10 minutes at whatever store we're at. <laughs> Grab it. Put it in the basket and let's go. Let's get out of here. And in our house, the toilet paper goes over the top of the roll. Oh. And until I got married, I didn't even know that you had a proper way to put on a toilet paper. <laughs> I just was glad when you showed up and it was there. <laughs> in marriage, this is really the goal that we're looking at. Uh, it's okay to be different from your spouse. Uh, if you'll notice, many of your weaknesses are your spouse's strengths. 
and many of your spouse's strength, uh, weaknesses are your strengths. Uh, Lee and I have realized after a while God probably put us together the way he did because uh, you know, I can handle the things that fit my personality well, and she handles the things that fit her personality well, and we make a pretty good team at that. You know, I, I don't figure the checkbook or pay the bills because I'd lose them all and have no clue what was going on because I'm not very detailed or organized. But man, she can hand me a bill and say, can you call these folks and talk to them about this? And I'm like, thank you. I would love to do that. That's fun. Uh, and so we, we just, it's okay being different. Now, in our differences, you have to understand that it takes a while to mesh those uh, and to see that. And in a world where we are constantly being told it's all about a wedding, uh, our goal is not weddings. Our goal is 50 years of marriage. That's what we need to make a goal for. I get frustrated at Google sometimes. You just try it. Get on Google sometime and type in the word marriage and hit the word image. And just see what kind of pictures they have. They don't have pictures. This is not a picture that will pull up. You'll see bridles and wedding dresses and flowers and groomsmen. And while I understand what they're getting at, I get frustrated because too many people in our world, one of the reasons the divorce rate is as high as it is, is because we've become so consumed with the wedding part that we've missed being prepared for the marriage part. And we need to do a good job of going, yeah, whether you have a big wedding or not, that doesn't matter. How do I get to 50 years? How do I get to 60? Whatever years God gives you, how do we get there where you take your spouse's hand when you're 80 and go, we did it. We made it. We survived. How do we get to that point? And that's kind of what we're talking about, all right? So, uh, here's your one thing that you need to do, and we'll start with husbands. We're going to talk to husbands and then wives. Here's your one thing that you need to do, husbands, and that is pursue your wife. Um, the word pursuit is the key word we're looking at in here for both husbands and wives. Be a good pursuer. Now, you did that uh, pre-marriage. Uh, if any of you guys in here are hunters or, or gals in here are hunters, you pursue what it is you're hunting. Uh, you figure out what they like, where they're going to be, uh, what they like to eat, uh, and, and then you stalk them and you uh, uh, figure out, yeah, this is just like marriage, ain't it? Uh, you, you figure out where they're going to be, but, and, then, and then once you shoot this trophy whatever it is deer you catch this trophy trout whatever whatever big bass a lot of times me, that's just men men let's put that bad boy on the wall you know we got that and we've here's the deer i pursued back all in 2018 and i finally got him at the end of the season but you know what you don't do with a with a deer that you have mounted on you never continue to pursue it because you've already got it there's no continual pursuit we do marriage, men do marriage that way a lot of times. They come in and they put forth such great effort to win. Uh, they pursue, they do things like hold hands and write notes and take them on dates. They do all these things up front. And then when they say, I do, I do it's kind of like, I got her. I got her. Here she is. And, and we quit pursuing. We quit chasing. And, and your wife married... Uh, a, a man that pursued her and she still needs pursued. She still needs chased. She still needs you to work as hard to keep her as you did to win her in the first place. Open those doors, buy those flowers, write those notes, whatever it is in there. You have got to continue to pursue your wife. Let me throw one more thing at you and then I'll let Lee, Lee take over for a second. Um, <laughs> one of the most frustrating things in the world are companies like, please, man, if you work for one of these, please don't get me wrong. I'm just using this for an example. Cable companies, uh, a direct TV or a dish that signs you up and they woo you into, we got all these channels and you're going to 12 bucks a month and man, we love you. Sign up right here and we will do whatever. And then you're six months, eight months into this and it's like your bill is doubled and half of your channels are not there anymore and you call them and you go hey my neighbor just signed up and he's only paying you know $25 a month and I'm paying $72 well he's a new customer and it's like 
at the start of the relationship, it's like we're going to do everything we can to win you. But then six months in or a year in, it's like what is the minimum that we can do to keep you? We, we don't want to go out any extra at all. Just the minimum. And, and sometimes in marriages, man, that is a killer when in marriage you go into marriage going, I am going to give you everything I've got, and then a year later you're going, what's the minimum that I have to do to keep you? That is not a healthy way to do marriage. Not just for men, but also for women. It is important we continue to pursue. You want to keep going or give me a... Yeah, kick us off with the first one. Okay. Date your wife. Date your wife. Now that's under your category, men, because you were the one that did the... The planning and the dating back pre-marriage. You really were. You, when can I see you? What night are you free this week? And then once you get married, it's kind of like she asks all the time, can we go out on a date? You plan it. I'll see if I'm free. You know, no, men, you need to be the one that steps up and says, what's a good night for this week for us to go on a date? You may be sitting there going, hey, this is a weird time in our world, and we can't go on dates like we used to. There are a lot of dates you can still do. I promise you. Doesn't have to be maybe a date like you used to have, at least not right now, but you could still go on dates. We've had a lot of fun at home dates this month, or last month. We've kind yeah, of in December. Out. We, we, we tried to, we had a lot of folks going, we can't date anymore. And we were like, we're going to give you an example of 12 at home dates you can do. And we threw these on our social media, Facebook and on Instagram, and said, here's what we did last night. We went to a concert in our living room. We dressed up. We had, man, we had so much fun on some of our dates. Yeah. Yeah. So it's possible. Uh, we do hear a lot from young couples that, you know, dating is just not in the budget. We can't afford to go on dates. And we hear you. Know, we were there. We had small children and babysitting is expensive. And we did not live near any of our parents or, you know, we, we just, we had nobody that could just, we could just say, hey, would you keep our kids for a couple of hours? So we finally thought, you know, if we're going to go on dates, we can't afford a babysitter. Um, we hit up some friends that had kids about the same age as ours that we would get together with occasionally. And we said, hey, would you guys keep our kids Friday night? And then we'd love for your kids to come over Saturday night. We'll keep your kids. And so we just kind of figured out, we'll just swap babysitting. And that you know, took care of that expense. And our kids thought it was great because they got to hang out and play with their friends, you know, two nights in a row. So uh, that, was, that was a really great plan. And then we just got creative with the dates themselves because there was a while that we were really on a tight budget. And... Uh, you know, occasionally we would do the whole, you know, dress up, go for a really nice dinner, go to a concert or something, but that wasn't something that we could do on a regular basis. Um, so we would just like, you know, maybe we'd go through uh, somewhere that had a dollar menu, order something, you know, a couple of cheap burgers and take a blanket to the park and have a picnic, go for a walk afterwards, feed the ducks. Uh, just, you know, that was a cheap, cheap date, less than 10 bucks, depending on how much he decided he was going to eat off the dollar menu that night. Um, get creative with your dates. They don't have to be expensive. Maybe you just, uh, maybe you both work and your kids are in school during the day and you can do lunch dates real easy. Do a lunch date uh, if that's what you can do and your evenings are busy. Uh, if your kids are little and you can put them to bed pretty early, put them to bed and then have a nice dinner, you know, maybe order pizza, watch a movie. You know, whatever it is, but keep on dating, it's so very healthy. And don't count double dates for this. Now, we love to hang out with our friends, but when we do, you know, the guys usually sit in the front seat and they chat and the girls are in the back seat and we're chatting and, and Trey and I don't really get that one-on-one -on -one time that we need when we go on double dates. And so while, yes, it's great fun to go with another couple, don't always count your date night as, True. yeah, that, that doesn't count as your couple date night. Date night is fuel for your marriage, and you need to continue to date. Number two, be affectionate. Be affectionate. Uh, most wives, maybe not your wife, but most wives have affection as a high need in their world. Now, affection is things like holding hands and flowers and notes, and we will give you a few ideas on that. Figure out what it is your wife likes and do those things, basically. But uh, be affectionate. Um, it's important that, that you try to meet your wife's needs, even if they're not your needs. Uh, that's kind of how that works. Yeah, when we do our marriage workshop, we usually have a little, uh, it's not in here, is it? Our, so. our His Needs, Her Needs. Oh, no. Um, we really love the book, His Needs, Her Needs by Dr. Willard Harley, and maybe you've heard of it. Uh, but at the top of most women's list of needs is affection. We really want affection, and it's a lot of the things that Trace mentioned, like 
holding her hand, writing her a sweet note. Um, snuggling on it, the couch. Snuggling on the couch, giving a back rub and not expecting anything in return. That's, you know, something you, you have to learn. Um, yeah, make, bring her flowers every once in a while. Uh, you have to learn, though, your wife may not be the one that wants the big bouquet of flowers that cost $50. That was me. Trey used to do that, and I would think, oh, my goodness, I could have bought so many groceries with that money. Um, so I had to kind of explain to him, you know, that, honey, I love the thought. It was so sweet, but please don't spend that much money on something that's going to die in a week. Um, just, you know, a single rose. He learned that he could... Scored, yeah, cheaper. He could score just as much points, if not more, if he went the cheaper route with me. Um, so, but your wife may be the one that wants, you know, the big bouquet of flowers, and you have to learn that. So you might ask her a little homework assignment. Um, Neighbor lady lives across the street. And she's got rose bushes, and I found out a few years ago. I asked her. I said, "Could I pick a few of those for my wife?" She loved that I had brought that up, and, that I, and now every year she calls and tells me my roses are ready. Could you come? <laughs> this year she called and she said, "I have set a vase out for you <laughs> on my porch. Come pick flowers." He said, "Do I still get credit for that?" Um, if your wife sends you to the store for a gallon of milk, maybe you slip her favorite candy bar in the bag uh, just to show her, you know, hey, I was, I was thinking about you. Um, but there again, you have to know what your wife's favorite candy bar is. Uh, so another homework assignment, if you don't know, you write that out to the side to ask her. How many, how many of you think you know what your wife's favorite candy bar is? I'm just curious, just curious, okay, I was just wondering. If you don't know and you're at the store, if you'll just get some chocolate, you're probably going to win, all right? It'll be all right. Um, just, just sweet little things that you can do for her throughout the day. Maybe you send her a text message and say, I'm thinking about you. Uh, maybe you have a minute just to call and check in. Um, when you come home from work, uh, if you know she's had a really long day, maybe you offer to cook dinner. Maybe you're the cook in the family all the time, because we know a lot of men that are. But if you're not, if you offer to cook her dinner, she will love that. If you just don't cook, then you say, hey, I'm going to order out. Uh, you know, we're going to do carry out tonight, and I'm going to take care of dinner. Um, help her with the dishes. Better yet, you tell her to go sit down, prop her feet up, and you do the dishes. Uh, just all of those little things. Uh, little acts of affection really go a long way. Mm -hmm. Figure out, maybe some of the best things you can do is ask her, what what is it that you like that I do? Because she may bring something up and you go, wow, I didn't even know that, that was a big deal to you. And then you can do that. That's a healthy thing. Yeah. Very healthy thing. Uh, number three, treat your wife like she's God's daughter. Another way to say this, we, I, I used to say, treat your wife really well like a princess. But I like this point better. Treat your wife like she's God's daughter. Because she actually is. If, you, uh, if your wife is a, a, a daughter of the king, if she's a Christian woman, <laughs> you thought about this for a second, you married a princess, you married a daughter of God, and you have a heavenly father-in-law that expects you to treat her in a certain way. And you know all those stories. Lee and I married very very, very young, right out of high school, and we dated for four years. And I remember we, we talked about getting married forever. And so it came up, you know, hey, you get out of high school next year, are we get married? Sure, it's great, let's get it all planned, let's get married. And then she said, are you going to ask my dad? And I remember thinking, ah, wedding's off, I'm not asking him. You know, he's big and he's scary and, you know, and you're young. But... Uh, yeah, it's one of those things to where I had a good, healthy respect for my father-in-law. Now, you, you want to talk about a healthy respect for your father-in-law. Think about having God as your father-in-law and treating your wife in such a way that you know he's watching. And it might help you to rethink the way that you treat her, uh, that you're kind to her, that you're nice to her, that you... Times when you want to be gruff, uh, when you want to use a tone, and you want to be a, a grouch or angry, that you remember, ah, my father-in-law is watching. Uh, there is a verse in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, uh, I believe it's in verse 5. You just read verses 1 through 5 or 1 through 6 and you will find it. But it actually talks about, uh, Peter uses the word, word weaker vessel. Um, and you could uh, translate that to say, it says, 
It says, your husbands, treat your wife as a weaker vessel, is what Peter says. That's an old King James translation. It's treat your wife like she's breakable, like she's valuable. Uh, and that's what he's saying. She's very, very breakable. She's very valuable. And you treat her gently, Peter is saying. And, and then he goes on to say, if you don't, don't worry. Don't, don't waste your time praying to God because he's not going to answer or hear any of your prayers. Because he's, that's my daughter that you're not being gentle with. So, so it's important for us as men to be gentle and to treat our wives gently, uh, like they are very breakable, emotionally, physically, uh, verbally, sexually. You just go down the list of all those things. God wants you to be very cautious about being rough with her in any form or fashion. Treat her as you should. Um, we raised, raising four boys, uh, one of the things we tried earlier, I tried early as her dad, was I wanted them to love and respect their mama. Uh, and, and we had kind of a joke that went on forever, and my kids still can quote it and, and call it the big joke or the big speech. Anytime they kind of got gruff or talked back to their mom when they were little boys, you know, I would point at them, I'd go, you better stop. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of this world, and I'll create another one just like you, and we will replace you, and we will not miss you if you're going to treat your mama like that. <laughs> You know, and, and they got to where they, they just helped me quote that every time. But they, what they understood was, you treat your mama different. She is a woman, and you treat her gentle, you treat her careful. Um, you know, I love the fact that I've opened the car door for Lee for years, and our youngest sons, all they know is when we go out as a family together somewhere, somebody opens the door for mama because that's what they're supposed to do. And, and the, I'm training them boys someday when they have a wife, they're going to go, did you, did you know your son opens the door for me, the car door? And I'm going to go, yeah, he better, you know. Treat your wife like she's gentle. Teach your children to do the same, that it's unacceptable uh, to not be kind to your mama. We're going we're gonna to raise boys who are kind and sweet uh, to, to their mama because then they will be to their wife someday. I remember, I, I tell you that because uh, my oldest was military, five years uh, special operations ranger that did a lot of uh, awesome stuff in Afghanistan. I'm still finding out all the time some of the crazy things he did. Uh, he was on uh, the Army's Tier 1 task force, meaning he pretty much was... With, was what we understand, what you understand about Navy SEAL Team 6 is what he was on the Army side. And so uh, he did about 30 night missions in his five years in the military. Uh, they put him in all kinds of bad, dangerous situations, and, and he loved his time, and he loved being able to do that. But they trained that boy. And I remember we were coming back one time from uh, picking him up from a deployment, and he was getting ready to go back to Afghanistan for some more missions. And we had him, and we were getting back to an airport, and we realized we had a little, we were getting to the airport a little early. And when you have an army kid, you don't want to drop them off early. You want them every second you can have them before they you have to let them loose. So we stopped off at a store not far from the airport, and just thought we'd hang out for a second and walk the aisles and get a drink and whatever. And be, a, be on time. Dad was over here watching the clock, going, "All right, we got to leave in ten. We got to leave in five. And I'm giving them updates of when we need to leave each of those times. Uh, because I want to get him to the airport on time where he's not in trouble. And we got five minutes past leave time, and then about ten minutes past where I thought we should leave time. And I finally got a little gruff with that boy's mama, my wife, and I said something like, look, I don't know what you're doing, but you got to stop, and we got to go. And I said it in a very harsh tone, because I was concerned about things, and that kid looked up at his dad from across an aisle and said, uh-uh, we're not gonna talk to her like that. And I remember thinking, I've taught that boy well. I am proud of him. He said, we are not gonna talk to her like that. You know, he didn't bring me into this world, but he probably could have taken me out, right? <laughs> um, I love the fact that I raised a kid that said, uh-uh-uh, no, we're not gonna, that's not gonna work that way. It's important that we treat our wives as if they are what they are, God's daughter. 
uh, pray for and with her. Pray for and with your wife. Um, in our marriage workshop, we give a little challenge at the end of the day, a five-day challenge, which we have one for this workshop as well. But in our marriage workshop, we encourage uh, husbands and wives to pray together every day for five days. And a lot of couples are not taking advantage of this spiritual intimacy that they could have. Um, well, we got an email several weeks following one of the workshops that we had done from a lady, and she said, we, we attended your workshop and we did the five-day challenge, and she said, I want to tell you that the praying together made such a huge difference in our marriage. And, uh, you know, we were so happy to hear, to hear that because we, we thought, you know, maybe some of the other things in the challenge would make a bigger difference in a marriage, but for them, that's what made a huge difference. And, um, you know, in our book, 10 Ways to a Stronger Marriage, the first book that we wrote, we have a whole chapter, uh, well, it's titled, what's the name of it? Let's Get Naked. Uh, no, the, actually, but that, not that way. No, that one's the Is one on, the, on, no. Oh, the, that's the honesty. That's it. The, the chapter on spiritual intimacy is, uh, I'm trying to look at what we actually titled that. And, of course, I can't find <laughs> the index here. There it is. Uh, the overlooked intimacy. The overlooked intimacy. Okay. So there's just so many couples that aren't taking advantage of spiritual intimacy and how close that can bring you together. Um, yeah, there's never been a wife that I know of that has said, you know, I hate it when my husband prays for me. Uh, so pray for your wife. Pray with your wife. It's it's an important part of marriage. Yeah, tell her tell her you prayed for her. Ask her, is there something specific I can pray about? Uh, we, we actually brought a couple of books. Uh, we wrote this one last year. We wrote this one this year. Um, this one was fantastic. It did, did really well. It was on Amazon's number one list of new books for uh, several weeks. And, and it is just on good, healthy marriages. Much of what we talk about in our marriage workshop, that's this book right here. Uh, discussion questions in the back. But we, we kept getting people that would go, we want a devotional book to, to do together as a husband and wife or me to do about marriage mm -hmm. that could help us to read our Bible together and pray together. And, and so we weren't planning on writing a book this year. We were gonna do it next year. And we had quarantine and we had all this kind of time. And so we decided to write a book this year. And so we've actually written a book on Proverbs. Uh, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. And in a month is what we started ours actually in January. Uh, you just go through a chapter a day and it's short chapters of uh, uh, things. Chapter seven was don't be brainless. And it generally starts with a discussion and a, and a few points about uh, what you read in Proverbs 7 and a story, some things to fill out. It's got some discussion questions, some scriptures to look up, and then it actually has a prayer prompt for couples to help encourage them to know what to pray about from that chapter. Uh, just a short prayer in there. And this book has done amazing. It is amazing. I love the fact that there are tons of couples out there that are reading their Bible together and they're praying together uh, and studying together every day through the book of Proverbs and it's blessing their marriage. Uh, spiritual intimacy, we understand, we, boy, we, we, we talk about sexual intimacy, but spiritual intimacy is so overlooked and so many couples don't catch it. And, and going to church is part of that, but there's so much more once you get home, when you read your Bible together that day and maybe talk about what you've read and, and pray together. It's just a healthy thing to do. Um, help her around the house. Talk about this one? Yeah, we, we kind of base this on our relationship because you kind of are more in charge of the house than yeah. I am, but that's not always the case. Yeah, in, in our marriage, it was the case. Uh, we just made the decision that I was going to stay home with the kids and I did not work outside the home. So I did take care, you know, of most of the cooking and cleaning and laundry and all of that kind of stuff. But we, and we know that today, <clears throat> most husbands and wives both work outside the home. So this should say really, you know, if that's the case, then you're splitting duties uh, equally around the house, uh, not just helping around the house. But, um, you know, I remember a specific time when, a very specific day when Trey came home and, and I know he probably, you know, stepped over toys, uh, was coming to find me when he got home from work, stepped over a pile of toys, walked through the kitchen that was messy, came to find me where I was folding laundry and, you know, putting away laundry on the bed. and. And he greeted me and, you know, how was your day? And we chatted for a minute and he said, is there anything I can do to help you? And I was irritated by that because he had not seen the toys or the, 
dirty kitchen or you know notice I'm folding laundry while we're talking. Um, but what I failed to realize was that he had asked, you know, what can I do to help you? He wanted to help. Um, so I had, you know, I had to realize just give him a job and then tell him he did a great job and he's going to ask again. Uh, but guys, yeah, help help around the house. Split those things equally if you both work outside the home. And if you've got little ones, uh, really be even more aware that, that they take so much of your wife's time. They take your time too. But they, you know, they depend on mama so much when they're little. And, you know, if she, even if she does stay home all day like I did, and you come home and the house is a wreck and you're thinking, what'd she do all day? Well, she might have been reading books and building Legos and playing dress up and, <clears throat> And all these things that are so much more important than loading dishwashers and uh, dusting furniture, and because those kids, they just grow up so fast, and that time gets away from you so fast. So, be patient when the kids are little, and help out around the house even more when they're in that stage. Good point. Uh, number six: Be interested in things your wife is interested in. Uh, find similar interests. But uh, learn what your wife likes. I've, I have learned in the past 10 years of marriage uh, or the past 20 years of marriage to, uh, to get into home remodels, to learn to watch things on HGTV. Uh, I have, uh, I've gone from a guy who barely could change a light bulb to uh, we've totally gutted to the studs, uh, bathrooms and rebuilt them, you know, because that's what my wife liked. Um, my wife likes junkin. Do you know what junkin is? She loves uh, uh, trade show or flea markets. flea markets. She loves flea markets and little thrift stores. Uh, and I've learned I can walk into a thrift store with her and I can pick out. I can go. My wife's gonna like that right there. I, I've hung out with her enough to know what she's gonna like, not like. We for for one of her birthdays a few years ago, she said, "I want to go to Canton, Texas." Uh, and I remember thinking, what's Canton, Texas? Well, it's the biggest flea market in America, literally. We walked one day nonstop and didn't cover everything. And, and I told her, my first thought was, oh, man. But in my head, I told myself, you're going to go and you're going to have fun. You know, <laughs> you're going to like this. You're going to learn to like And it wasn't bad. It really wasn't. I told her, I said, you go. <laughs> said you buy whatever you want and I will carry it for you all day long and I will not rush you and we can we can you know you can look at stuff at the first booth and turn around and come back at the end of the day and buy it if you want you know whatever you want to do and I carried stuff all day long there were stuff she'd look at and I go if you want that we'll, we'll buy it. you know I just decided we we're gonna have a good time and we had a great time we're gonna go back one of these days but I've learned what she's like but not too long ago we had a community cleanup uh, where our, they, the dump open said, hey, y'all dump for free and all this kind of stuff. And a bunch of folks from our church got trailers and pickups and decided they'd go around going, hey, y'all need us to haul stuff off just to help the community out. And me and uh, a guy were dumping at the same time. And I was unloading mine. He kind of helped me. And I jumped over on the back of his trailer and started helping him unload. And he picked up an old door out of his trailer and was just about to chunk it. And I said, whoa. And he goes, what is it? I said, Where'd you get that door? He goes, it was in a pile of somebody's junk. I said, that goes in my pickup. And he goes, you want this? This is going to the dump. And I said, I don't want it, but my wife does. <laughs> Put that in my truck. I got home and I said, hey, come out. Let me show you what I found. She came out and looked back here and she said, oh, you are so good to me. <laughs> she loved that old door. I think, I think it's in our house now. I'm not sure where it is, but she did, <laughs> she did some project with that old door. Most of, you, most of you guys, let me just tell you, you got to go to stores to buy your wife presents. I go to the dump, you know, <laughs> find my wife stuff she likes. But you learn to like what you're your spouse likes learn to take an interest in things that they like to do because she's done that for for me all the time but learn ask about her work ask about things she's got going on at work ask about her life and take a genuine interest in those things uh number number seven uh be the spiritual leader in your home be the spirit i'm not giving you that job god is ephesians 6 verse 4 ephesians 6 verse 4 Fathers, train your children, okay? Uh, model values and integrity. You show your kids how to live. You don't just tell them. Somebody knocks on your door and you've told your kids, we don't lie in this house, 
Don't you tell your kids, tell them I'm not home. You're telling your kids, yes, we do lie in this house. You model values and integrity. And then pursue her and not anyone else, not pornography, not another person, not another relationship. She's the one you pursue. You started pursuing her, you continue to pursue her. Don't slow down on that. If there's one thing in your marriage you can do to bless your wife, pursue her. Keep chasing. Every woman, every wife needs a woman. Every wife needs a, a husband who will continue to chase her. Uh, every husband needs a wife who will slow down and let him catch her. So, so let's, do, let's do wives for a second, okay? Let's do wives for a second. Now, it doesn't change. The same here is true with pursuit. You need to also pursue your husband. Now, you may not know. You may be going, well, I didn't pursue him. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Let me tell you some of the things you did to pursue him when you wanted him to notice you. You flirted with him and you batted your eyes and you twirled your hair and you touched his arm and you I mean you just go right down the list and and he kind of thought well I kind of like her she she's sweet on me you know you bragged on him man when you were dating the ridiculous amount of bragging that you did uh, you bragged on everything from your hair looks great I like your shirt your truck is so nice you know whatever it was I like your dog you know you he bragged you bragged on him so much he just loved hanging out with you because you were always saying something nice about him always all of those things you need to keep doing you know what else you did back there to pursue him remember when you went on dates remember when he come over to see you and you would get dressed and fixed up to go on a date and you would walk out and you just really kind of wanted him to say one word when he saw you. What was that word? That's it. Wow. You dressed up for him. Remember that? And you wanted him to go, man, you look good. Now, he still likes that, okay? He still likes that. When, when he plans that date, you pick out something that he's going to go, wow, you look really good. Uh, he still likes that. In marriage, you know what we've done? Don't take this wrong. It's okay. We can be comfortable in marriage to an extent. Before marriage, your, your spouse saw you only when you would fix up around him for the most part. You dressed up. for You're going out on a date. Wow, you look good. When you get married, you know what you do? You come home from work, and a lot of times we wear our nice clothes. You come home and go, where are my pajama bottoms? Where are my sweats? I cannot wait to get in my house shoes. Where is my bathrobe? You know, whatever it is. Where is my oversized hoodie? Uh, that got half of you right there. Didn't it? And your husband's going, where did that little curvy girl that I married go? Where did my sweet, you know? Uh, so we, we just get sometimes to the point that we only dress down around our spouse, and that's not healthy. We need to dress up for our spouse as well. So uh, sometimes that means for men, for, for me, to pick something out other than a black t-shirt or a white t-shirt to wear. You know, I actually find something with some buttons and put on. Uh, and for a wife, that may mean, you know, don't look for the, the oversized hoodie the second you walk in the door or dress up for the date, whatever it is. Uh, those were all things that took place. So, but let's keep going on this list, all right? Give your husband lots of praise publicly and privately. Give your husband lots of praise. Uh, you did that before marriage, he still needs that. He loves it when you praise him. Have you ever noticed your husband, get this, tell me this ain't true, wives. Your husband can do the smallest little chore around the house and he will come tell you what he did. Like he's <laughs> expecting some trophy for him, right? And you're wondering, why does he do that? I'll tell you why. He loves when you praise him. That's exactly why he does it. He loves it when you go, good job, hoorah. He loves it when you are his biggest cheerleader. And, and he may find the smallest thing and not even think about it and go, hey, I loaded the dishwasher. He may go, I loaded it the last 100 times. Why are you telling me this? Because he simply wants you to go. He wants you to be proud of him. One of the greatest things you can do is give your husband a lot of praise. Just, I mean, little stuff, big stuff, uh, fine things to give him praise. That's really how God built most men. Most men are built that way. That if you got little boys, you, if you hadn't figured it out, it won't take you long that your boys 
uh, are motivated by praise. You can just kind of walk in the room and go, it's house cleaning day, and they'll go, oh, I don't want to clean my room. Good thing y'all are the world's best cleaners. And I mean, they're up trying to pay, but we're the best cleaners in the world, and they're up cleaning stuff. That's kind of how God just built boys. Men respond to their wives' praise. If you knew, ladies, how much power you have to either build up your husband with your words or to really crush his self-esteem with your criticism. Man, you would, if you could really understand how important that was, you would realize, man, I need to tell him regularly he's the best dad in the world. He'll believe it. He'll be in there wrestling with them kids all day. He'll be in there helping homework and everything else, whatever it is, because he'll go, man, I'm the best dad in the world because she told me that. We love when you wives give us praise. We just do. It, it just, we want you to be our biggest cheerleader and fan. We want to impress you. We still want to be your hero. Uh, that is important. Uh, little stuff. We, man. We clean house together on Saturdays when we're home, and I have my list of about three or four jobs, and she's got her list. I don't do hers, she don't do mine. Mine are the ones that I know how to do well, and she's got her. She's got the hard stuff, but I got through with my list not long ago and, and knocked my stuff out, and I, I thought, well, I'm done. I'm going to go find something fun to do, and I noticed she still had a lot to do on her list, and I thought, all right. I'll practice what I preach. What's on this list that I can do? And she had her little duster sitting out, and I thought, I'll go start dusting. So I'm dusting the living room. You know, I don't do that very often. I'm dusting the living room. I, she comes walking through and just stops and looks at me. She's just watching me. And I said, what? She said, you're dusting? I said, yeah, I thought I could help you. I said, that's all right, isn't it? And she goes, yeah, but i got to tell you, I don't think I've ever found you sexier than you are right now. <laughs> dusting my living room. And I said, Really? She said, oh boy, I dusted the whole house. <laughs> there, was, there was no dust to be found anywhere. And if she came through the room that I was working on with my duster, I'd flaunt my sexiness everywhere. <laughs> because she was proud how hard I was dusting that day. It don't take much for us guys. You heap that praise on thick. That's important for us, all right? Uh, give your marriage priority over your kids. Give your marriage priority over your kids. Please don't, I'll say this, and don't, don't, we're not telling you to neglect your kids. Keep things in order as they're supposed to be. We tend, we tend to never neglect our kids. What we tend to neglect is our marriage in order to raise our kids. That's the point we're trying to make here. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as moms, we just really want the best for our kids, and, and dads do too, but moms... We just want to give our kids all of these opportunities to develop their interests and you know figure out what they're good at and where they can really flourish and and we get them in all sorts of you know maybe art lessons or gymnastics or music lessons different sporting events and um, you know the next thing we know we're we're going to recitals and we're we're taking kids to practices and we're we're volunteering for concession stands and it just seems like our lives start revolving around the kids' activities. The, the busier our kids get, the busier we get because we probably are, you know, working full time, and then we still have to do all the cooking, clean, and shop, and laundry, and and we just find ourselves dropping in bed exhausted every single night. And I don't know if you can relate to that, but there was certainly a point in our lives that 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 seemed to be the case. And it's really hard to do number three with that. It's really hard to make your love life sizzle when you're dropping in bed exhausted every night. Um, I like to lump these two points together because uh, just for that reason. I mean, we just, we get so busy and our schedules get so hectic and seem to kind of take over. And like Trey said, you don't want to, we, we never neglect our kids, but sometimes we neglect our marriage, not on purpose, but we just kind of let the kids and all of the busyness take over. Um, we love the book Sheet Music by Dr. Kevin Lehman. Um, we, we highly recommend that book. When we first stumbled across it, um, I was just kind of flipping through and I was looking at all of the title chapters just to kind of see what it was about. And one of the chapters just really stood out to me. Uh, and it was Sex's, or The Greatest Enemy of Sex. And I thought, ooh, what does he, what does he think that is? And I flipped over immediately to that chapter and started scanning and, and just, I mean, 
you know, second or third sentence in, and he was saying that busyness and weariness is the greatest enemy of sex. And that's so true because we just, we let life get in the way of our needs. And, um, you know, I told you that Dr. Willard, Willard Harley says that affection is generally the greatest need for women, not every woman, but generally. And the greatest need for most men is sexual fulfillment. And so that's why it's so important to guard your schedule and not let yourself fall into that busy trap where you're just pushing things to the back burner and you're letting life get in the way of marriage and, and maybe your love life isn't sizzling quite the way it should or quite the way your husband would like for it to. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that there is a, that you need to understand is there is a peak, there's actually a spike, let's put it that way, there's a spike in the divorce rate um, they, there's certain areas, you've heard the seven year itch, you know, it's like seven years, there's kind of a spike in the divorce rate. Another one of those little spikes that for a long time people couldn't figure out why it took place is about 22 years of marriage. People were like, how do you get 22 years of marriage and then start having problems? Well, what happened was you'd get couples who have spent all of their time raising kids. They have been, 22 years they have been mom and dad and not husband and wife. And they get to empty nest. And all of a sudden they realize because they haven't been husband and wife and they've just focused on being mom and dad, they aren't just uh, in the empty nest, they also have a very empty marriage. And so it is important that you hit empty nest someday and you don't have an empty marriage. So it's important that you also remember, yes, we are mom and dad, but we are also husband and wife. And that needs to be an important part of that. We'll, we'll talk about this for a second. Several, few little fun points for a second, okay? Uh, let's talk about nine ways to ruin your sex life. Since we're talking about making your left life sizzle, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of these here for a second. All right, number one, uh, allow your kids to sleep in your bed. Allow your kids to sleep in your bed. Now, if they show up on occasion, that's okay. If they show up at 3 o'clock in the middle of the night because they had a bad dream, that's okay. But every night at 8.30 is unhealthy. That's really co-sleeping, as it's actually called these days. It's really not the best thing for marriages today. So be cautious about that. We met a young couple with four kids, four kids under the age of six. And they said, we got problems. And I said, well, let's talk about it and see what we can do. And they said, all four of our kids sleep in our bed every night from 8.30 on. They said our intimacy and sex life is nil. And I said, well, I, my first thought was, boy, I don't know what to even tell you. Uh, but we came up with a plan. We told them, said, fine, let them all go to bed in your bed, and then you go sleep in their bed. And then if they come find you at night, you move to another bed. And you start, you start working to get them out of your bed today. You start explaining to them that we are all not sleeping in the same bed together, that mom and dad need to have a bed. So be, just be cautious of that. Number two, uh, another killer is uh, don't make privacy a priority. Meaning, if you still have children at home, Every master bedroom door should have a lock. It just should. All right? And if you're sitting here thinking, well, I don't have a lock. Oh, you stop on the way home at Lowe's and get one, okay? If you're a contractor in here and you build homes, don't you ever build another home without a lock on the master bedroom door, okay? You're saving marriages uh, as a contractor. Um, because when you have little ones and you put them at bed, to bed at nighttime, you're, you're kind of like, uh, you know, we understand what it's like. It's the whack-a-mole game. You knock one down and one pops up, and you never know when one of the kids are going to get up, and it's always kind of like, are they asleep? Can we go have some time together? You get them down, and you go lock your door without having to worry, is somebody going to come walking in? And, and, and your kids will learn after a while the door is locked, and you, you know, that is our time. They can pick the locks, too. They probably can. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Yeah. There's a story there. That's impressive. Uh, let your, letting yourself go can ruin your sex life. Um, I mean, this can cover so many areas. And we know that when you're 50, you're not going to look like you did when you got married. Uh, but eat right. Exercise. Um, See a doctor. Like, yeah, see a doctor. If there's something, you know, that is just getting in the way of intimacy, don't let your pride get in the way. Um, and I'm especially picking on men here because men don't like to go see doctors a lot of times, especially about something like this. But go see a doctor. 
Uh, if there's something in your past uh, that you need to work through emotionally, go see a counselor. Don't let pride get in the way. Um, you know, we like to talk about uh, physical hygiene. You know, men sometimes get to thinking that, you know, uh, grease and grill smoke and things like Grass. that. Fresh you cut know, women usually think that soap and toothpaste smell a little bit better. So uh, hit the showers. Um, but yeah, just don't let yourself go. Yeah. Uh, number four. Stop flirting with your spouse. Um, men really like it when you flirt. And yeah, women. I think women do too. Women, women yeah. like to be flirted with. Uh, flirting is something that uh, uh, should never stop in your marriage, and that's something that uh, is a very healthy part of marriage, whether you've been married for two months or 20 years. Uh, saying no to sex more than you say yes uh, will ruin things because eventually somebody's going to quit asking. Uh, a lack of communication. Um, you know, I think if one thing that we teach in our, our marriage workshop is God is not embarrassed. God is the creator of sex for married people, and he's not embarrassed by it, and so you shouldn't be embarrassed to talk to your spouse about it either. And so communicate about it. And, and if you go, well, I'm a little uncomfortable, that book Sheet Music we talked about a while ago is a great book to read together, which we've done. And it makes you talk about a bunch of stuff that you, you just kind of maybe would be uncomfortable with the rest of the time. But yeah, lack of communication. Make everything more important about sex. This is what we talked about earlier with the busy schedules. It's number eight. Uh, Getting stuck in a yeah. rut. Um, yeah. Don't always have to do the same thing the same way. Yep, make it all about you. Uh, that's a bad thing, meaning like if it's your need, you don't have to be, you know, make sure your spouse enjoys it as well. And let me throw this in right there. Yes, go. Just because we've kind of geared this towards sexual fulfillment being the man's number one need, but uh, statistics say that 23% of women uh, have a higher sex drive than men. So we just want to throw that out there because a lot of times in our marriage workshop, we would have women come up to us and why are you saying that, that men need this and women, you know, it's not as important to women and what's wrong with me because I have a higher sex drive. And so uh, we just want to say that if that's the case in your marriage, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. We just have to talk to uh, the general majority. Yeah, majority. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, if your husband's uh, general need is a sexual fulfillment, then uh, we always like to say wives, be willing to initiate more often. You say, why? One, because your husband does not know when you're in the mood. Uh, most of the time, your husband uh, would love to know when you're in the mood. And we, we enjoyed a, a comedy act the other night. Somebody sent to us on a video, this, this guy talking. He goes, he goes uh, the other night, the other morning, I got up, my wife goes, I sure wish you had been in the mood last night. I was. And he goes, why did you not tell me? I, I, I would have loved to have known that. She said, I touched my my, my foot to your leg and you just didn't do anything. And he was like, that's the sign is a foot to the leg. You know? He said, can you give me a little more next time? Uh, yeah, uh, your husband doesn't know when you're in the mood. And, and if you're a wife and, 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 and if you're in that group that's got the lower sex drive, you may not understand how your husband works. You may be going, well, how do I know if he's in the mood when I'm in the mood? It, you just kind of look at him. If there's air moving in and out his lungs, he will be in the mood pretty quick, all right? All right, you just let him know. Uh, it makes him feel desired. Um, I was telling the women earlier that uh, the greatest enemy of sex for women is that busyness and the weariness, but when you go on to read that chapter, uh, he talks about the greatest enemy for men is a lack of feeling desired. Men really want their wives to want them and desire them, so that's important yeah. for men. Uh, your husband loves having you involved, all right? Uh, number four, let's go back to our main list. Uh, we talked about this, we won't cover it a whole lot more, but uh, wow him, dress with an aim to please your husband. Most of you by now, ladies, have realized you married a, a husband who's probably very visual in nature. That's just kind of how God created men to be. And so uh, you pursued him pre-marriage uh, by dressing with an aim to please him, do that as well then. Uh, take an interest in something that he likes to do, in whatever hobby that it is that they like. Uh, if it is hunting or fishing or college sports, they love when you will do something with them. I love that Lee plays fantasy uh, baseball with us every year and goes to baseball games and things like that. I like that she likes to 
uh, go to the gym or whatever it is, things that I like to do, uh, I really enjoy that, having someone who takes an interest in things that I like as well. Uh, we met a lady uh, not long ago, and, and she said, I wish I'd get my husband to go on dates with me more often, but I just can't seem to get him interested in going out. And I said, well, what does he like to do? She said, all he likes to do is deer hunt. And uh, I, said, I said, because he loves when you take an interest in things. And I tried to explain that to her. And I said, here, let's just do this for me. Just try this. You're probably going to have to ask, because he's probably given up asking you, but you need to ask him the next time you go hunting, deer hunting, can I go up off the floor, um, tell him that you want to go, and, and he may say, yeah, come go with me. She, she sent an email, and I, and I told her, I said, and then, and then later, after spending some time doing what he likes to do, don't you gripe, don't you complain about it, you go have fun, then ask him if you can plan the next date. And uh, we got an email from that lady, and I thought, uh-oh, she's emailed me to tell me I am full of bunk, you know, and I don't know what I'm talking about. And sure enough, she'd gone on her, she said, I've gone on my feet fine. She said, we watched the sun come up, we drank coffee, we spent time together. She said, we didn't shoot anything, but she said, that didn't bother me at all. And she said, my husband loved that I went with him. And she said, and by the way, we're going on a date next Thursday night. And I remember thinking, thank you, Lord, for making that one work out. <laughs> uh, but your husband loves when you take an interest in things that he And for your husband. Pray with and for your husband. So just like we talked about earlier, um, you tell your husband, I pray for you today. Uh, you take turns at night uh, praying and, and just simply after you go to bed with the lights turned out, dear Lord, thank you for my husband and for our marriage and our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, number seven, flirt with him. Flirt with him. That's, that's a good one. Uh, we re-put that one up there because most men really, really love it when you flirt. Uh, 